So this is meant to be actually a deep type, se a deep type seven, but I try to cover all these uh, basic uh, ideas that we have in chargeback for you. So um, the presentation is built on a um, pre-GA version of uh, chargeback 1.5, which was actually released um, a day before yesterday. So uh, this may contain some um, material that is not um, available in the GA, but I think um, actually it isn't. So this is the agenda. Uh, we first have a look at the product architecture, and after that we will see how we can deploy um, Touchback in an environment, in a large environment, in a small environment, and how that does fit into your um, infrastructure. After that, we are going to cost models, and cost models are the basic, basic um, idea how to deal with all these uh, meters that are available in our vCenter database that are pulled out into chargeback and used for, for billing. And uh, we will see how we can do even uh, more advanced um, billings. If you have an idea how to build your systems, you can um, create your own billing policies within this new version of chargeback. After that, we have a short look into the VCD integration. VCD is our um, cloud portal. It was announced um, in yesterday's keynote. And um, it is a pretty nice thing that you can have a um, self-service portal like in the cloud portal of VCD and integrate it with chargeback to build all these resources you um, sell to your customers. After that, we uh, will see um, how we can um, deal with uh, scheduling, and we will create um, a small schedule for a report that is pulled out of our um, chargeback. Um, then we will uh, take a look at uh, roles and rights. We have a web-based interface, and we are able to uh, get Active Directory user users with uh, special roles so that you can delegate um, specific um, administration to your, to your customers or to your users from chargeback. And um, not finally, but we will see an, some examples for the API. Um, all chargeback functions are also available through an API, so you can customize uh, nearly everything that is available in the chargeback uh, program. Um, who, are you, who of you is interested in, in the API, who is actually doing some programming and scripting with vSphere and so on? Is there anyone? No? One, two? And finally, we will show um, a usage report, showback model, because especially in Europe, we have this um, idea of a cost center and not of a profit center. So um, the IT has to earn as much money as they spend over a year, and they are not allowed to, um, to gain more than they actually spend. And we will see how we can um, do this in chargeback. So the architecture, this is from a marketing perspective, the architecture of um, vCenter Chargeback is actually that we have a database for Chargeback itself where it stores its um, uh, configurations, its cost models, its users, and so on. And this um, database is, um, is filled with data from vCenter. And we, if we look at the vCenter database as a data warehouse where all this information about our virtual data center is stored, um, then we have an idea what we can do with all this data if we do chargeback or capacity um, IQ, for example. We just use this uh, already present data and um, do some math on it, and now we have chargeback. And that is what chargeback is all about, using the data that is already there and leverage it for um, your billing system. Um, actually, we don't see that uh, the administrator of vSphere is using the chargeback program very often. Um, we see that um, um, the controlling department or other departments that are dealing with um, the cost models and cost centers and so on are more frequently using this uh, program. And that's why we build a web UI for it. And not an we also have an integration into the vCenter so, um, client, but actually, uh, a web-based interface is much more um, convenient for all these um, users because they do not have 
to have this uh, full installation of your data center administration, your vSphere client. And we also integrate with third party products because we have this API. And with this API, you are able to pull out um, any data that Chargeback has or to even configure um, Chargeback, though it fits to your um, department structure or whatever. This is the architecture from the inside. We can see on the um, bottom, let's see if my mouse is working here, I have a pointer. Yeah. Here, this is a chargeback database, the heart of everything. And this is connected to um, the vCenter database through JDBC. And with this information from the vCenter database, we are able to process all the information and get it out through our um, web-based um, UI. We have also data collectors for the vCloud. We will see it in uh, later slides. And also third party integration through um, um, the API, which is actually working um, with the RESTful programming. And this all here is in the heart of uh, Chargeback and all its um, single um, ideas and instances. We are working with a um, Java application that is running on Tomcat, so it's, uh, and it's running on Windows. We had to have um, appliance for that in the 1.0 version. I'm not very sure if it's um, still available for 1.5, but keep in mind that this appliance is not ready for production and it's only for test purposes. And you can't update to, the, um, to a productive version with that. It's only for testing. But I just fig um, try to figure out if it's still available. But uh, unfortunately, I do not have access to the download web page, so I can tell you, because it was GA a couple of days ago. So Chargeback itself can be installed on a single instance of an operating system, of a single server. Um, but Chargeback is very scalable. We will see in later slides that we scale beyond most installations of vSphere. And for that, we have a very um, um, an architecture that is able to, to spread over several machines. In the basic deployment, we will basically have a single chargeback server here with a uh, single instance of a database that has a um, collector to vCenter server that is collecting these, uh, the data from, um, from vSphere, from the vCenter database. We can also have a multi-site deployment where we connect our single instance to multiple vCenter servers. Um, how many of you have multiple vCenter servers in your environment? Uh, that's a lot, maybe, maybe half. We see that a lot that um, we have not a single vCenter instance because we have um, branch offices and so on, and therefore Chargeback can deal with up to 10 um, vCenter servers at once. If you have more than 10, who has more than 10 vCenter servers? Then you're lucky because Chargeback can only deal at the moment with 10 vCenter servers. If you have more than 10, you have to have a second instance of a Chargeback um, system. But we are planning to, to scale that up to the limits from um, vCloud Director, which is actually a limit of 25, 25. 25 um, vCenter servers that are connected at the same time. The UI itself, the web-based UI, is behind a load balancer. And this load balancer ships with chargeback. It is integrated. And actually, you, have not the, um, you are not able to exchange this one with an external load balancer. So in a large deployment, we see that as a single point of failure, um, because we can have behind that multiple chargeback servers that are present the actual UI. But the load balancer is on the first instance. So what are you smart guys doing if? Um, single point of failure server is, um, is present, you protect this with HA or with FT. And that is our um, recommendation to protect this system with um, the capabilities of the vSphere, vSphere platform to have it as um, available as you want to. In my opinion, Bill is a bit different. He wants to protect this with FT. FT means I have to have um, one CPU only. Um, but in my opinion, Chargeback is not as um, enterprise. Um, 
it's not so important that the enterprise have to have it high available. If it's down for three minutes, I think who cares? Because you, you only deal once in a while with the system, you configure it, and then it does it all automatically for you. Okay? Uh, but if you want to, you can have um, the single point of uh, failure, the load balancer protected by fault tolerance, and then you're covered by the SLA you um, assign for, for chargeback. We can also have multiple data collectors. Um, if you have a widespread uh, vCenter server uh, installation, we can have multiple servers that are connected to um, the database and collect the data. This is. These are the limits of chargeback. And um, as I said before, it's far beyond most of the installations. Um, we can have um, with a single um, instance and a basic deployment, I showed a slide before, up to 3,000 virtual machines. And I think that will cover um, approximately 90% or even more from all of our customers. But you can stay, scale up to a 10 vCenter servers and up to 35,000 um, VMs, which is uh, for uh, the sc um, scalability of vCenter, uh, um, vCloud director, which is designed for um, service providers that has more uh, instances of virtual machines than a usual enterprise has. These are other numbers, and as you can see here, it, as I said before, it scales far beyond most of the um, installations, 35,000 VMs, 10 vCenter servers. Concurrent reports means a concurrent processed um, reports or builds that you are calculating. And hierarchies is a idea that you have um, in the center itself. You have, an, um, you have sorted your virtual machines by technical needs. For example, you have um, resource pools, you have clusters, uh, you have in the inventory um, maybe a Windows 2003 machines all put together in a single folder and so on. And this is a technical need to have this, um, this uh, orientation. But from a cost perspective, from a cost um, center perspective, you may want to order all these machines in a different way. So you have to um, create your own hierarchies where you put all these virtual machines in vCenter and drag it into the right folder. And the folder is, for example, the, um, the department. And so you can have a um, aggregation of virtual machines and then later put a, a bill or a report on that. And we have um, the ability of creating 5,000 of these hierarchies. And hierarchy can be um, also a one-to-one -one synchronization with your vCenter um, environment. So if you already have um, an orientation in your vCenter that fits to your um, cost um, billing needs, you can um, synchronize it one-to-one. -one. So how can you protect your vCenter server? Um, as we have seen on the slide before, we have um, a deployment of multiple vCenter chargeback servers um, within a cluster. So if you have a single instance of vCenter uh, of chargeback and you have it uh, with less than 3,500 virtual machines, you can protect this with um, HA, for, um, for instance. Um, the design itself, itself from the um, from the program, from, um, from the architecture, is scalable in that way that you can have multiple um, instances of your chargeback. You can have multiple instances of the data collectors, um, but you have a single point of failure, as I mentioned before, with the um, load balancer. The other recommendation is to set, and it's already done, the window services that are um, necessary for chargeback to auto start or restart if a failure occurs. The database itself for chargeback is an external database. It doesn't ship with, um, with chargeback. Um, and also in the appliance you uh, could download for the 1.0 version, there's no database included. This means you have to use an external database. It can be like in our lab in SQL Express, um, but you have to keep in mind that you have to um, fulfill your needs for the SLA for the chargeback system itself. So it depends on your environment and your needs how you protect um, the database. Um, very often it is um, the same SLA as, in, um, as you have for your vCenter server itself because 
if uh, the system is not available, you cannot charge or you cannot bill anything. If the, B, the database or the vCenter um, chargeback system is not running, that does not mean um, that it cannot charge for the period it is um, offline. It catch up with the information that vCenter stores. Okay? And we have two possibilities to, to use um, the database of chargeback. We have either the, um, the possibility to use for billing the vCenter database itself directly and not replicating any data from the vCenter database in the chargeback database. But when an administrator deletes for maintenance or whatever for troubleshooting um, the vCenter database, and then there's nothing to charge anymore because there's no data available. That is why we recommend that you replicate the data. This is uh, during your installation, a single um, checkbox, that you replicate all vCenter data into the chargeback data, and then all um, reports and all um, calculations are from when chargeback are running, is running against this um, replication database. And as I mentioned before, to protect um, the data collectors, you can have multiple data collectors, and you set it to auto restart, and um, this replication mechanism is running, I think, every 15 minutes. So now cost models. If you have a hierarchy, and a hierarchy was the aggregation of virtual machines for a specific needs, um, you have to have an idea how to charge these items. And this is a cost model. A cost model defines how to charge for um, the hierarchy items. And we have basically three different um, cost models. The first one is fixed costing. That means a VM, regardless of its size, of its uh, configuration items, is a fixed amount of, um, of money. That means, for example, $500. But that is obviously not a good idea to charge any virtual machine the same, because if it has, um, if it allocates more um, resources like disk or memory, it should be charged more. And this is a second um, idea, allocation-based costing. You charge for the um, the count of vCPUs. You charge for um, the memory that is assigned to this virtual machine, or you um, you account for the disk storage that is actually used. But some say that is also not a good idea, and it's even better to um, charge for the resources that is actually using. So for example, you have um, two virtual machines, both configured with two virtual CPUs. The one is, one is running on 100% CPU all the time, and the other one only once in a month for, um, for a couple of minutes with 100%. And um, then may someone comes to the idea that he will pay less for the one that is not using the resources so much as the other one. And that is utilization-based costing, like we had it, it in former times with the mainframe, where you had CPU cycles that you charged. And this is also now um, possible and available with um, recent chargeback, that you only pay for what you are actually using regarding CPU cycles and the uh, meters are gigahertz per hour, and for the actively used memory. Because, you know, with um, vSphere, you can um, overcharge, your, over um, allocate your systems. You can share um, physical CPUs between um, virtual machines. And then it's a better idea to charge for the actual used systems. But we, will, we find in most um, companies that nobody is ready for this um, cost model because it's far beyond everything a client-server um, architecture has ever thought about. How's about you? Who thinks that um, utilization-based costing is a good idea that he will implement tomorrow? No one. One. Yeah. Yeah. We will move to that um, cost model, but yet, we are not ready for this. We are um, between the fixed costing and the allocation-based costing, and I think most of you um, have the uh, allocation-based costing, which uh, raises a question, who of you is actually um, charging for the virtual machines? Yes? Maybe? 
Yeah. Yes, Ab absolutely, exactly. Yes, but in the way that you compete with um, a public cloud, with your internal cloud, you will um, see that these cost models will maybe come to your mind to be implemented. So a cost model is a set of, um, of information. A cost model is this fixed cost, allocation-based or uh, utilization-based um, idea. And then you can also apply to a cost model one-time costs. A one-time cost is, um, for example, um, the creation of the VM itself or the deletion of the VM. You may charge for a system uh, for the provision, pro provisioning for the system. You can also apply um, a single-time fixed cost for, um, let's say, you have a data recovery in progress for this specific machine because um, one of the smart guys deleted a file, and you want to charge for that. This is a single um, one-time fee that you can apply to the cost model, to the, to the bill that will show up um, at the end of the month. Um, actually, I'm looking for ideas what a one-time cost is. Has one of you an, um, an idea on additional information what a one-time cost might be in their companies and orga organizations? No? Maybe a service ticket? Troubleshooting? No? Okay. We were still looking for that. <laughs> so now we come to a custom billing policy. And um, a billing policy, as I said before, is fixed cost allocation based or um, utilization based or a mixture between all these. Maybe you want to charge the utilization of the virtual CPU by um, gigahertz, but you want um, to charge the disk by its allocation. Or you maybe want to uh, do not charge um, any, anything for network traffic. So you can have a mixture between all these um, different items, be between uh, CPU, memory, um, disk, and network, put them all together, and we have pre-configured many of them. But sometimes that does not fit your need. And for example, a service provider may want to charge only if a virtual machine is powered on for CPU and memory, and he always wants to charge for the disk because it's also allocated uh, when the virtual machine is powered off. And to create such a um, custom billing policy, Bill will show you how to work with a web-based UI um, for this specific example. Super, thanks, Karsten. Well, so for anybody who hasn't seen Chargeback yet or taken the lab, uh, this is the getting started screen. And uh, there's a number of tabs that go through here um, for all the different areas where you might work. And uh, manage cost would be where we're headed uh, in terms of the billing policy. And as Karsten mentioned, you know, there's all different uh, combinations of those three basic uh, types. Uh, usage, allocation, uh, and fixed. And notice that we also have some uh, billing policies that uh, indicate uh, maximums. But uh, there aren't any he in here that specify uh, whether you want uh, to only charge uh, while the virtual machine is powered on. Uh, so for any reason, if you find that you don't um, <clears throat> have um, a billing policy that's delivered and you want to build one yourself, you can create a new policy. And uh, the way that we do this uh, in this user interface is we pick, first of all, the resource. Um, and then we have an opportunity uh, for that resource uh, to indicate that we want to uh, only charge if the VM is powered on. So that starts that expression if VM power on for that CPU resource. We also have an option to say um, that we want to charge uh, for the greater of uh, the various uh, billing attributes. So we could say charge for a particular hour, charge the greater of 
uh, reservation, uh, actual usage, or if you've um, specified a unit allocation, which is sort of a threshold, if you will, it gives you the ability to set an arbitrary um, threshold below the threshold, you can charge one rate above the threshold, you could charge a different rate. Uh, typically in, um, in virtualization, we tend to think about charging more uh, at a higher rate uh, for bigger virtual machines, specifically around uh, CPU and around uh, memory. So that completes our uh, billing policy for the CPU resource. Uh, so the next thing that we'll do is we'll uh, build a billing policy around the memory resource. And once again, we can specify uh, that we want to only charge for memory uh, when the virtual machine is powered on. And for those different attributes, we can also uh, choose the greater of uh, size. So in other words, the, the memory that's actually configured in the virtual machine, allocation, so that would be uh, below or above a threshold, or a reservation. In this case, the reservation would be set in vSphere. So for a particular virtual machine, you can set up a, a reservation so that if the virtual machine is powered on but it's not really using very much, um, it would use a reservation. Now, in this particular case, if we look at um, size allocation, usage reservation, in almost, well, in every possible such scenario, it would always be size as the maximum, right? So this is a little bit of, a, of a, just an example. Um, we also have the ability in a billing policy to indicate uh, that we want to allow for uh, arbitrary fixed costs. So there's an option at the bottom uh, that allows us to do that. Um, now we can then also choose uh, storage as another resource. And um, in the uh, storage area, we have the ability, now we're gonna, not gonna say um, if VM is powered on, we're gonna say that you're always using storage if you're there. Uh, but we do have the option um, to specify that we want to use uh, allocation or usage. So if I say allocation, even if I'm thin provisioned, I'm gonna go ahead and charge the whole rate. Um, and that would also extend to um, link clones in the case of view link clones. That is, each link clone would get, paid, would, would get charged for the full size of the base disk. On the other hand, if I say distribute link clones, then each link clone gets charged only a share of that base disk, depending, so if you have 10 link clones, each link clone would get charged one-tenth, plus it would get charged whatever its difference is, you know, whatever the, the data that it's actually using. All right, and uh, from there, if I tried to do a create at this point, what would happen is it says insufficient number of resources. So that means that I have to set up a rule for every single resource that's listed here. But there is a way out. If I'm done, I can say, well, for all other resources, I don't really care about any of the others specifically. I'm just gonna say um, allocation. And I could, if I wanted, I could say, if the VM is powered on, then do allocation. And this then will allow me to create that custom billing policy. So there we see it. Yeah, thanks, Bill. And I encourage you to do all the lab because if you have seen the interface um, has a lot of abilities and you have to have an idea of what it can do for you and what it all can do um, if you do the lab because it guides you to uh, on the different stages of um, building a bill or a report. So, integration with vCloud Director, which was announced yesterday in the keynote for GA. Um, if you're a service provider, your goal is to earn money. And this means you have to charge back the items. And this is why we, um, from the right beginning, from the um, creation of vCloud Director, uh, working together with uh, Chargeback, and we have a very tight integration between those two products. 
There's also the ability to use third-party billing. Um, so if you already have a billing system, you can pull all the data out of it. Um, of course, if you're a service provider, you're not present for um, since last week. You maybe have um, um, a long-time relationship with your customers and already a billing system that you can integrate with um, the cloud director. So. In addition to the met meters we have in uh, the common vSphere integration of a chargeback, we can charge for um, additional resources like DHCP, uh, NAT, and uh, fire firewall. With vCenter, um, with Cloud Director, vCloud Director, we have changed the name a lot, so. With vCloud Director, you are able to set uh, firewall rules for your customers. You have um, the ability to integrate DHCP services. You have a lot of um, possibilities to deal with networks. And for that, we have um, vShield Edge installed and um, combined with, with um, the Cloud Director. And Chargeback connects to this vShield um, Edge system and pulls out data that you can then build. We'll come to the architecture um, in a later slide. The um, billing policies for uh, the cloud resources you're using is allocation pool, reservation pool, and pay per V app. We introduced um, V apps in the cloud director. That is a set of virtual machines. Um, the one who knows Lab Manager is actually a configuration, the idea of a configuration. And you can in the allocation um, pool model, you can bill um, for a set of resources that you sold, uh, sell to your customer. But you, as a service provider, decide if you want to um, give these resources actually to your customer. And you can over-provision your whole system by just having more allocations to, um, provided to your customer than you actually have. And in the reservation pool um, approach, you really have, as a customer, the resources available um, that you paid for, OK? And with a pay per V app, you do not pay for an upfront for your reservation or your allocation. You pay only for the virtual machines you are creating. And this is pay as you go, as you may uh, have seen in the EC2 cloud from Amazon. Regarding the hierarchies that I mentioned before, um, a hierarchy is a set of virtual machines that are um, assigned to a customer. With our cloud director, you have organizations, tenants. And these tenants are built up front because of this vCloud um, system. And you know uh, which system belongs to which customer. And this, therefore, the hierarchy for all this is created automatically. You do not have to drag and drop all these systems from your customers because um, it is um, already available in the system, this information. And this is why we have auto-creation of um, chargeback hierarchies for their tenants in VCD. This is a new slide I have never seen before because it was uh, <laughs> inserted by Oh, OK, sure, I can comment on it. Um, just like we said in the previous, uh, as far as the different uh, models go, um, we're basically just indicating um, where we charge for types of events. Uh, so just like if the virtual machine is powered off, we're not going to charge for CPU. So there's billing models that are already included that we add with vCloud Director uh, to take care of some of these custom billing policies that I, I demonstrated for you. Um, now, if the virtual machine is powered off, we continue to, to charge for storage. I don't have on this slide uh, network, but we can also continue to charge for network. Because with vCloud Director, you're able to actually allocate an IP address. So you can charge for each IP address that is uh, actually allocated. And the virtual machine retains that IP address even if it's powered off. So naturally, they should charge, they should pay for that, right? Yep, that's pretty much it. And in addition to that, as Bill mentioned, you can, as a service provider, you care about the network traffic. And that's why we integrate with this Edge device to know how much traffic was sent um, over the wire. And you can charge for that. This is the integration of um, the VCD system. 
uh, this actually here, the um, big thing is the chargeback uh, system you already know and have seen in, in the previous slides. And here uh, on the top is a vCloud director with its own database and with vShield manager, which controls all these edge devices and creates these edge devices. And we are pulling out data from the database from cloud director, so we can have it in uh, the vCenter chargeback system um, for this auto creation of hierarchies and so on. And we can see, oops, we can see how much traffic was sent over the wire through the vShield manager database, which is pulled out through the API of vShield manager. If you create in VCD new organizations and um, new systems, it is a slight delay that they appear in chargeback. Um, this is especially um, of interest if you try it out and uh, have an evaluation installation, and uh, sometimes you get nervous because it does not happen instantly what you're clicking. So keep in mind that um, all these distributed systems need to synchronize, and it can take up to five minutes that these systems appear in uh, the chargeback system. And uh, do not backdate VCD hierarchies. We can um, also choose um, or have data that is um, earlier than the creation of the hierarchy charge. For example, you have uh, you install chargeback right now and you want to bill for previous month. That is a backdate. Do not do that for um, the cloud director systems. We've actually disabled that, uh, by the way. So it's, it's all good. It's all safe. Cool. <laughs> so a custom scheduler. The scheduler is the system that creates reports. And reports are, you will see that in the lab, um, a very information um, heavy. You can have um, a lot of um, information on that bill regarding um, who you sent it to. Um, your chief may be interested only in, um, in the basic data and the total amount, but the controlling is interested in every single detail. And um, we have here an example from a custom a report that builds only for a single hour. You can see here from 2 to um, 3 o'clock, we will get generate a report and just charge for the uh, resources that are um, used in this period. This is especially of in, a kind of interest for service providers who sell this um, machine just for um, an hour. And because of all this clicking here, and it's um, kind of um, annoying to do it every hour for every um, virtual machine you're creating the VCD, for example. You can do this all over the REST API, and it's then much more convenient and easier to do than in the UI. But you can do. And to understand what the system is actually doing, it's always better to do it manually f um, first and then do the script for it. And this is uh, finally the report that is created just for the period I mentioned before, an hour. And you will see how a report looks like if you do our lab. So roles and rights. Um, basically, roles and rights are designed for special um, access to your machines and systems. Um, as I as stated, we do not see the um, vCenter administrator as a main user of chargeback. We see it uh, in, in different departments. But you may want to delegate some um, some of your work, administrative work, to your, to your users. So you design something like an organization admin that is um, using or, or um, delegating access to the web UI to their own stuff. And you can do this um, through roles and rights. If you use your um, LDAP users, your Active Directory users, create a user with um, specific rights. Here it is. What did you choose? That's on the slide later. And you, you make them to a hierarchy manager, for example. And this hierarchy manager can then um, pull out other users from the database and assign um, the right to see reports. The roles we have are um, 
in combination with hierarchies, entities, vCenter servers, LDAPs, and so on. So it's very granular. And if you want to have a look, a deeper look in it, I encourage you to do our lab. Um, I think this here is uh, too te theoretical. What you have to keep in mind is that we are able to deal with Active Directory users, that we have roles in a web-based UI, and you can delegate um, some of your work to other people. So now I switch over to um, Bill again, because he is the expert in the <laughs> API. He's a Perl guy, and he will guide you through the next <laughs> couple of slides. Hiding down below the monitors over there. Um, so we've got a couple, one guy that sort of kind of does a little bit of in the API. Um, so basically, the, what REST API means, it's programmatic web browser, right? And uh, so whether you Python or Java, uh, I'm a Perl guy, so I did it in Perl. You can do it in PowerShell as well. There's an HTTP net object that you can, uh, you know, issue HTTP commands uh, in a script. Um, just like you would uh, a browser. Um, I, mean, I guess if you're really good, you could even do it in a browser, but it's a lot of uh, typing of XML, I'll tell you what. So uh, there is a detailed um, spec guide and also uh, the API reference and all the programming guides are available on our website. And it's fully supported as well. So uh, with, your, uh, with your SNS for chargeback, you can, you can include an SDK support uh, for that. Here's an example. Um, this is just a sampling of the, the different uh, API calls. So there's calls for um, specifying costs, creating hierarchies, uh, getting hierarchies. Um, I think for the most part, uh, the reporting API, that's the part that I focused on. That seems to be pretty useful in my uh, observation. If I wanted to do an integration with an external billing system, I would want some programmatic way to get at that data and get it extracted in, in a uh, XML format. Uh, the task management will see that, and there are some administration type uh, API calls as well. One call that I didn't put on here that I just learned about uh, last week uh, that's with chargeback 1.5 is there's an API for searching so you can search any sort of resource. It's a, it's a kind of a pattern matching sort of a search, and that would be very, very handy. Um, it's one of those things after you write the program, you know, it's always better to go back and write it again. So I'd probably go back and use the search API instead of the way that I actually wrote it, but that's okay. It's always better the second time anyway, yeah? Um, so the basic idea is, you know, you've, you've got an HTTPS request, so it co goes across a secure line. You're going to uh, pass into that a, a short uh, XML message that includes uh, the type of login, whether that's local or LDAP, just like in the GUI. Um, you're going to type in your, uh, your administrator or whatever username and password. And based on that information, then you'll only be able to access those resources that you've been granted. So it doesn't matter whether you're using the user interface or you're using a program, you're still secure, you're still only able to access what uh, you're allowed to. Now, if you do get a login success, then what's all important is that set cookie response that comes back which happens with you know, almost every website out there where anytime you log into a website, your browser gets that cookie. And so um, like with Perl um, in the LWP module, there's a, an option to enable cookies in your programmatic browser. And after that, that one small little piece, you don't have to worry about you know, sending that cookie along. It automatically grabs it, includes it in every subsequent request. So that makes it pretty straightforward. Now this is probably where I would probably, I would use the search API rather than what I did, but there is an API that says, give me all the hierarchies. Fortunately in our lab, it's a very small environment, so it doesn't take very long. Uh, but then what I do is I just go search all of the APIs, all of the hierarchies that come back, and I do a, a pattern match on the name, uh, and I get that, that ID. And then we look for the cost model by name. Um, and then we look uh, <clears throat> for, that, for the parent ID of that hierarchy. Um, 
we, once we have the hierarchy ID, the entity ID, and the cost model ID, uh, there, we need to specify the numeric um, number for um, uh, the resources that we want to charge for. In the back of the chargeback API reference guide, go to the appendix because it lists all of those numbers. <laughs> don't just guess. They're all there. They're all listed in there. Uh, but you don't say, I want to charge for CPU and memory and storage. You have to say 159. You have to give it the, uh, the index. Uh, epic time is one of those things that uh, is a little bit odd, but um, essentially uh, in the Perl utilities, it's uh, local time is the call, and it's giving you the number of seconds that have elapsed since 1970, unless you're running Mac, and then it's like 1981. I don't know what you would do. Why was that? Anyway, um, I don't know why you would do that, but... Um, the other thing is you have to multiply it times a thousand. So we're actually, chargeback is actually looking for epic in milliseconds. So it wants to know the number of milliseconds that have elapsed since 1970. Uh, but as Karsten mentioned, that would make it really easy to have a, a start and end uh, for an hour. So if you want it as a, uh, as a service provider, if a user wanted to know, well, what was my usage last hour or you know, from start and stop at any time, Using the API would be very easy to go get that information and they could see what they were uh, being billed for. Uh, and then ultimately you just simply request the report with the post command and you pass in this rather lengthy bit of XML that has all this data in it. Um, the report is queued at this point. So you have to sort of catch your task ID and then you have to go ask for that task ID and get the status. And once you see that the status is complete, then you can actually get the um, complete report. Uh, and the last call, which I don't put on here, is to actually log out, just to be safe. After a certain amount of time, you're going to log out anyway. Somebody else who comes in, unless they have that cookie, they're not going to be able to log in anyway. But um, at any rate. I'm going to go ahead with the show back, or you want to talk about it, or what do you want to do? Yeah. I'll do the Bill demo. is doing a live demo again. Yep. But um, as I said, um, the difference between a cost center and a profit center. Um, sometimes you only want to uh, charge for the amount of mon money that you already spend for your IT. And it's usually um, a one-year um, approach that you figure out what the cost for your um, data center is, and then, then uh, try to have with internal um, money transfers and internal costs, um, the ability to, to get all this money back. And the worst thing that can happen with that is that you get more money than you actually um, are allowed to earn. And to um, set a report that, is, uh, that fits this needs is um, Bill going to show you in a moment. And I'll switch over to the computer. All right, so uh, this is really uh, a very easy concept. Um, we're going to go to the uh, reports page. Um, I'm going to select a hierarchy that's been around for a little while, so we've got some, some data built up on it. Uh, this happens to be a hierarchy that uh, is divided into uh, the host and cluster, so we have different resource pools available. Um, I'm just going to right click at the very top and I'm going to say to generate a cost report. Now, the cost report I'm going to generate is going to be using the default cost model. Uh, the default cost model associates one unit of currency for each metric. So for each hour that it observes, it's a one for one. So if you don't look at the dollars, of the report, but you look at it more or less as a, as a usage report. It's just showing you how much was actually used. And I'll capture this report for uh, the month of July. So we're going to do this in arrears. And I'm only going to be interested in uh, CPU, memory, and storage, just for the purposes of this uh, example. And I'll go ahead and generate that report now. And so we see just like in the API explanation, uh, the report gets queued, 
and, uh, and then it becomes available. Now, <clears throat> I have a, an amount that comes out, and let's say that in reality what I'm interested in in recovering from a showback perspective is uh, $10,000 and not uh, the actual usage that's shown here. Well, it's very straightforward. I just go into my calculator and I enter that 10,000 and then I divide that uh, target uh, recovery by uh, the amount of the showback uh, report or the, the usage report. So 11,334.66. And that comes out to approximately uh, 88%. So I can copy that value and then I can go over. Um, we didn't really talk about a cost template, um, <clears throat> but if I go into manage cost and cost templates, I can create uh, what I'll call is my, uh, my showback uh, July cost template. And um, for CPU, for uh, memory, and for storage, I will uh, paste in, in that, um, that rate factor. So we're basically just gonna reduce our charge uh, by the rate factor that uh, our calculation specified. So I'll go back in to configure costs and I'm gonna edit the entity costs for this hierarchy. Um, you know, I have to go here. I'm going to say default cost model. I'm going to update for the effective period of July. And the cost template I'm going to use is our show back July. Now we see there is some rounding here that occurs, uh, but then we'll, we'll say update rate factor. And now I'm able to go back and run that report again. All right. And if I did everything correctly, it should come out to be roughly 10,000. So there's a little bit of a rounding error there, but. Uh, the interesting thing is that, you know, because we have our resource pools in this case divided out among pre-prod, production, and dev, you know, those could be, uh, it could be a folder structure as well, and it would show a relative share of our targeted collection as applied to each of the, the departments or groups. Thank you, Will. And thank you to you all. This is the end of our presentation. Please do our lab. Um, it will show you much more details on um, chargeback. Thank you. And uh, also, don't forget to fill out your survey yeah. uh, for this session online. All right, thank you.